Hey, welcome back to the Disney Plus Everyday Challenge, and today we have Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. Yes, this is a Pym Particle Hat, Pym Industries, whatever. Got it for free on Disney uh, Movie Insiders. Hey, hey. Oh, put it on my Pac-Man ghost. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. And yeah, today we have the latest uh, film to join uh, Disney Plus. Literally hours ago, I started a little late. I was watching something else with friends, and it's like it's like twenty minutes before four a.m. So we, if I fall asleep, or if you fall asleep halfway through this, well, at least I got the click uh, and made no money from it. Yay! Uh, this is obviously from 2023. It came out in February in the theaters. It's two hours and seven minutes long, and it stars uh, Paul Rudd as a Scott Lang Ant Man, and uh, wait, 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 can I say her name? Evangeline Lilly is Hope Van Dyne. Michelle Pfeiffer is Janet P uh, Janet Van Dyne, Pim ish, uh, and Michael Douglas as as Hank Pym. Uh, as our core cast, and also adding in, uh, well, who, Jonathan Majors is Kang. Yes, we last saw him in Loki, and Cassie Newton, uh, sorry, Catherine Newton as Cassie Lang. Those are the main characters, and now I will, you know, I'm going to tell you this right now, I'm going to spoil elements of this film, so if you have not seen the film at all yet, I'm going to tell you probably, unless you really love spoilers, I'm going to tell you not to, to watch this. Hold off. Just pause it. Go watch the film. Come back. And I'll be waiting for you to talk about what I saw. I've seen this actually a few times now. I saw it in theaters twice at least. Um, uh, mainly because I, I see it the moment it comes out in the very first screening. Uh, if I don't get an earlier screening. Uh, and uh, I also see it with some friends soon after when they're available to see it. So... I've seen this a number of times, and usually when it comes to films, good or bad, uh, I enjoy them more on the second viewing. And I know this has kind of gotten a little bit of shade uh, from a number of people as saying, it's not as good as it could have been. It, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, it could probably could have been better. Especially with the stakes involved in this. This is the start of Phase 5. I can't believe we're in Phase 5 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, but I think we have all the elements of this being good in it. If you look at it in a post-pandemic <laughs> Disney Plus era, post-Endgame era, in fact. Because, I mean, 2019 was when Endgame came out. And that was the culmination of so much, so much. And everything, people have said that, oh yeah, well, the Phase 4 seemed to be all over the place uh, because it was just introducing new characters because it's filling the holes left by the loss of two major characters in Captain America, Steve Rogers' Captain America and Tony Stark as Iron Man. Um, and Thor, yeah, he's made some movies and made some appearances in other, other places as well. But... Um, uh, the main core group, and all, yeah, we also lost uh, Black Widow, of course. That was she had, actually had her own film that went right to Disney Plus under a lot of problems between her Scarlett Johansson and Disney. Uh, it was, but it was because of the pandemic. So yeah, um, and I think I think we're, all, we're we're at this point where we're kind of really used to just watching our Marvel Cinematic characters on TV at a different pace, episodic than in a, on a big screen, even though, you know, it makes sense that the big, big moments of the Avengers films, which we will not get for a good long time, um, well, at least until the end of this phase and the next phase, um, <laughs> we're, we're kind of used to seeing all these brand new characters thrown here and there, and to bring Scott back and hope uh, to, to kick off a new phase. Remember, I think the first... Ant-Man uh, finished off Phase 2 at one point, if I'm correct. Here, they're starting off Phase 5 with the villain of the phase, the main villain of the phase, which was introduced first in Loki Season 1. And if you watched all the way to the end of this one, you see a little sneak peek of Loki Season 2 with Tom Hiddleston and uh, Owen Wilson gazing upon one of the variants of Kang on a stage in old timey America or somewhere. But uh, yeah, it's a, 
we, we get that Kang is kind of the bookend character in this. Yeah, you were going to see him pop up all over the place throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe over the next few uh, years. Uh, although maybe just the next two years, because I think Phase Phase 5 should be ending in 2025, I believe. Somewhere around there. And it, it all culminates with Kang. And Kang, played by Jonathan Majors, who, <laughs> for now, maybe. I, I really like Jonathan Majors as an actor. He elevates every single scene he is in with this underspoken, just sort of soft, menacing, which is probably also what's gotten him in trouble, soft, menacing tone, um, where he's just... You're frightened by him, by the, the you realize of the, the restraint his character has. Kang the Conqueror. Kind of a big name for a soft-spoken person who does lose his mind a bit here and there uh, when he doesn't get his way. And uh, that's kind of his attitude is in direct contrast to the full, the main attitude of our heroes in this. Kang, being a conqueror by nature, is out only for himself, for what he believes is right, what he believes he will do at any, for any reason, for good or bad. He, again, he's, the way Marvel does this, of course, very often, is that the villains don't see themselves as evil. They don't do things because they want to be evil. They don't take over the world because they're evil. They take over the world because they feel they're the best person to run it. In this case, Kang is a guy who believes he is the best person to fix the multiverse. And the multiverse is something... We're in the multiverse saga, saga right now. Um... And we're going to see various different worlds sort of coming together, clashing, incursions. Uh, we're just barely scratching the surface on a lot of this. Um, but it had to start somewhere. And it starts in Ant-Man. Mainly because, well, why haven't we seen Kang everywhere else? So the Kang that the comic fans know through all of this? Well, he's been trapped in the quantum realm, as we learn, uh, during a time in which Janet Van Dyne had been stuck there as well. This is, feels like it's been planned for a long time. Was she, all, was she always going to run into Kang down there? Is that Feige's plan? I, I, I don't know. But nothing happens by accident. It, what we get here is Kang uh, potentially on the loose, or at least um, a version of Kang that, through his actions, causes other Kangs to take more drastic measures and make take take steps into the galaxy or the multiverse of galaxy. I, I say galaxy only because this feels like Peyton Reed, the director's Star Wars. I, I'm pretty much sure that he's a big Star Wars fan. <laughs> and uh, this is his, you know, world building kind of film when it comes to the MCU. He can literally build in whatever direction he wants in this microscopic world and not cross into the paths of the Guardians of the Galaxy or an Avenger here or there. He, it, it's literally just, it's a toy box to play in. Uh, and that works on one level and it doesn't work on another level. I think one of the main problems that I have with this is that Ant-Man seemed so grounded in the first two, also directed by Peyton Reed. He seemed so grounded because he was an everyman kind of guy, down on his luck. He wasn't better than anybody. He wasn't cocky like Tony Stark. He wasn't uh, necessarily a forthright good guy like Captain America. He wasn't a god like Thor. He was a guy who made a lot of mistakes in his life, given opportunities to better himself, and he took them, and it did make him better. It improved his life and the life of his family and uh, his relationship with his daughter. This is a guy who's a divorcee and, and trying to struggle with keeping his daughter in his life and everything else. So he's one of us. And when he's also a former thief who's also asked to steal things as part of doing heroic things, you see the kind of contrast, the comedy that's in that and kind of the tension that happens when... He's trying to stop doing what he wants to do, but is pulled back into doing it for the greater good. And but yet in the end, he's always doing it for uh, to helping to helping 
other people. And it, one of the themes in this is helping the little guy. And it's not just a quote in his book, which we get a lot of info dump in the very beginning of the film. Uh, in, there's a lot of exposition in the first part of this film, a lot. And all the way into the middle, really, there's a lot of exposition. And that also kind of, in some ways, drags it down for people who are wanting a superhero action film. I mean, you want to see Paul Rudd, and you want to see him be funny, and yeah, sure, he's kind of got this cocky, funny kind of thing going on when he's reading his book in front of a bunch of children at a local library in San Francisco. And he's, you know, he's he's kind of getting the confidence that he never necessarily had. And he's getting fame, he's getting the adoration, he's he's being treated, even if he's misnamed by uh, the, the guy who runs the coffee shop, he still is... Uh, He's in the best place of his life right now. And he gets to have his daughter in his life. And she's getting into trouble by doing this, doing crimes, <laughs> but things that are seen as crimes by trying to help the little guy. Uh, we, the first time we see her, she's coming out of jail and she's, uh, they're, they're not breaking her out, but they're getting her release, paying her bail or whatever, and getting her out. Uh, she's detained for, deal, for using uh, Ant-Man suit uh, that she got somehow. Uh, you find that out in the film. Uh, she's using her her powers, abilities, uh, through the Ant-Man soup, suit, soup, suit, uh, in order to fight against police who are breaking up a homeless encampment. And, and she's looking out for those who are less fortunate. She's looking out for those who were displaced due to the blip. And everything else. So she's trying to do good. And she sees her dad as somebody who's not, who's kind of moved into a comfortable space now, not doing the hero stuff so much. And he teaches her this lesson, um, the lesson she learned from him, but may have forgotten, that he, he may have forgotten. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, hubris is all over the place in this. Obviously Kang, but Cassie, uh, taking those steps uh, to explore the quantum realm, which opens up a whole can of worms, much to Janet's greatest fears coming true by the fear of having Kang set free from that land. Why is Kang trapped there? Well, we find that out in one of her lengthy back, uh, flashbacks and uh, explaining all of what happened, which is actually the most interesting part of exposition in this, because again, more Jonathan Majors, the more awesome this film is. Uh, again, he, he's committed some alleged crimes and it's, it doesn't look good. <laughs> I really, uh, I'm not standing up for anybody who does what he's been accused of, um, but if it doesn't work out, we might be getting a new Kang at some point. And that's going to suck because he's good in the role. And it's a major role. It's not like replacing Rhodey. Rhodey is great, but they replace Rhodey in Iron Man 2. Uh, with a great actor, of course, but still, this is kind of a big deal. Especially since we're, since we're going to see him in October in Loki. And it would be kind of a weird disconnect if... Uh, Suddenly there's a different actor playing that role, and they just had to reshoot all the scenes or something. So, um, yeah, I've gone down a weird rabbit hole here. Uh, the themes are there. It's a family adventure comedy. Um, and I was saying how we're used to seeing Scott as more of a grounded hero that we can relate to. Uh, it's funny, like we wish we were funny. Like, I wish I was funny. And we get to sort of go along with his adventures. And his adventures have always been sort of self-contained. They weren't... The rest of the MCU did not hang on them. This is a very different film. What happens in this film affects the MCU going forward. The decisions he makes in regard to Kang affects all of the MCU. Marvel Cinematic Universe from here on out. And a kind of a drag. And and he's in it is doing it in front of a I don't know if they'd shot it in the volume or whatever. I mean, they probably have a volume down in Atlanta where they shoot most of the Marvel films. Um, like they have one here in LA, but 
like use the Mandalorian and stuff like that. Or they just did it in front of lots of green screens because the digital department is just working overtime in this thing. And there's a lot of digital backgrounds. There's a lot of just creating this massive world. And it kind of disconnects you from Common Man Scott. And it's it sets him in the middle of a sci-fi adventure. You expect that with Guardians of the Galaxy. You expect that with just more cosmic level stuff, Eternals and things like that. Even Eternals was more earthly grounded. They weren't in the quantum realm, but they were still earthly grounded for most of that film, even though their story takes place over a vast period of time and in space as well. Um, here, that kind of loses that spirit where Scott... It's a, it's, a, it's a fairly serious film. Lots of high-stakes stuff going on just with Scott. Kang threatening his daughter. And, uh, I mean, yeah, sure, Yellow Jacket uh, threatened his daughter as well. But he returns in this, spoiler, he returns in this as MODOK. And that's something else that made a lot of people kind of upset that he's just a big, giant, floating head with baby arms and baby legs who has delusions of grandeur and power and everything else. No, MODOK is definitely the uh, mechanized, uh, the blah, designed only for killing. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know why I forgot that. I've known about MODOK for centuries now. i got to make sure this doesn't time out because I'm talking so long. Um, I, he's brought back and he's kind of, he's the mini boss in this. He gets to do the villainous stuff. He gets to say the villainous lines where Kang, like I said, is more restrained. MODOK becomes a joke after a while. And when you have a character who looks like that, yeah, you're going to poke a lot, of, get a, make a lot of jokes about him. He's a character that's been a serious villain for many years. In recent years, They've leaned into the joke. He's had his own series, which is actually really funny. It's really good. Uh, Patton Oswalt voiced him in a uh, animated series on Hulu for a while. You should check that out as well if it's still around. Uh, that got canceled after one season. But uh, it's still... Um, if, if you need more MODOK, there's plenty out there. He's appeared in all sorts of other animated things like the Avenger Avengers and uh, other animated stuff on Disney+. Plus. Uh, but he kind of... Uh, he's... He's unsettling, and he's... I can understand why they used him, because he is a bridge to Scott to make this more personal, more of a a direct connection. You kind of need that, because honestly, when it's Scott, the tiniest Avenger, up against Kang, which is one of the biggest villains in all of Marvel history, you, if you're a Marvel fan, you know he's incredibly outclassed. It's it's fact. <laughs> the idea that these two could go head to head and Scott win is just nearly impossible. So the odds, the drama from that, from the odds being stacked against him, is pretty incredible. Um, and at some point, you get, you get Kang saying, "Hey, uh, you may not want to go against me. I know what's coming," and that's a hint of Kang Kang's dynasty. He knows what's hap going to happen. He's seen the future. He's a guy who travels in time. If you didn't know that, I, I probably should have said that from the beginning. He's a time traveler. He is, uh, if you watch the mid credit sequence, you see variations of him from many different eras where Kang settled down and took hold. In fact, some of them are the same Kang, but from different eras coming together. Immortus and Ramatut and, and uh, the other guy who looked, probably was the future, future one before he went into the past. Yeah, he's from the future, by the way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I normally, I love time travel stories, but this, um, we're only just dipping our toe into this water just a tiny bit, starting with the Loki season finale, season one finale, and then um, this. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it, it could, people maybe didn't like it because it was confusing, or maybe it just didn't, live up to the normal big, bigger comedy that uh, we're used to with uh, an Ant-Man film and the more groundedness, but yeah. Uh, this is just kind of one of those films that I think was made to perform a function rather than just tell a story. Uh, yes, it's, it's creating motivation for Scott to get back on track and do the hero thing. Um, 
because some of it's gone to his head a little bit. It's, he's one of the guys who defeated Thanos. It's it's on all the the on the book jacket and the and the advertising for his readings and everything else. He, you know, when he's hobnobbing with uh, Captain America and everybody, he, he yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's this is meant to ground him, but at the same time, the film and where it takes place and yes, that lesson of helping the little people in this quantum realm also gets driven home. So it is messagey. And for some people, maybe that's that really uh, bothers them to be messaged to. It's not subtle. Uh, but yeah, it's... it's uh, I think this is a film that can be enjoyed better in context, context over time. No pun intended. One of the things I find interesting about this is that... The, the end. And here it is. A big spoiler. In the final battle, Scott and Hope are fighting Kang to the death. And they get trapped in the quantum realm. Part of me thinks, I wonder, and then well, that they might have never left, even though it shows them the portal opening up again and them walking through it, back to their life. Part of me wonders that uh, maybe this reality might be different. Slightly. Just a slight way. And at some point, when we see a new team of Avengers suddenly take hold, we might discover that the real our 616, or whatever universe they're in, 199, I don't know. Whatever reality this is, we might discover, Cassie might discover that her dad and Hope have been living in the quantum realm for a long time. Probably right after the other Ant-Man and Wasp get killed in a future film. That's my guess. It's a total guess. I do not know that's going to happen. It's just, yeah. Uh, by the way, if you haven't paying, been paying attention over the last two phases or so, they're building the Young Avengers. Cassie is one of them. Her name in the comics is called Stature. And uh, yeah, you're going to want to pay attention. <laughs> Between Hawkeye and America, from the Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, yeah, they're building towards that. And also, by the way, there's a lot of talk of incursions, realities colliding and everything else. They mentioned that in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and here. Uh, nothing is spoken of by accident. And someday, we're going to find behind all of this, more than likely, is doom. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I could be completely wrong, but I have a feeling I'm not. Anyway, let's see if I hit all the notes. I took notes this time, and I printed them out, and now I put them in small print, and my eyes don't work. And I am forgetting see if uh, I missed anything. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Stay light. Um, yeah, um, I don't, I don't want to be an apologist for this. I, I enjoyed the film. It Maybe I'm, it's not my favorite of the Ant-Man films, and it's not my favorite of any of the MCU films. Um, but uh, if you're talking about <laughs> a functional story that's necessary to the furtherance of the MCU... Yeah, I think that's going to be a problem if they keep doing that. If they keep making films that are just functional elements, a building block, and not doing more for the characters in the story. I, I, I don't think that they didn't do anything with them, because obviously there is growth and there's, there's change. Um, and, but I think it might have taken a back seat to... Uh, the greater purpose of the film. I don't know. It's something uh, you got to think about. Uh, blah, 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 Scott and Hope never returned. Yeah, that's what I get, I guess. Kind of have to watch it and see how it's edited. Like, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I, I could be completely, I like it. I'm probably wrong. I'm probably wrong. But uh, I know there's going to be a little bit of Effery. A little bit of some screwing around that's going to play with your head eventually. Because when we start seeing multiverse versions of heroes we know, 
uh, by the time the Kang Dynasty film rolls around, yeah, this is gonna be some crazy, crazy stuff. Um, ba -ba -ba -um. yeah, okay, well, I'm just gonna, I know I'm gonna hate myself because I'm not reading all this. I wrote too, too much in small print. Why did I do that? Uh, but yeah, uh, the main thing about this is, remember, Kang's goal is to do everything for himself, for what he thinks is right. And what everybody else is working towards, our heroes, of course, is normally helping the little guy, helping those. And that is the eternal struggle as we're going to see characters moving forward in Phase 5, uh, how they fall on one side or the other. Kang may have been, uh, this Kang may have been the essential piece of the puzzle that could save the universe. And we might look back at this film and go, oh my gosh, if this had turned out differently in Ant-Man and the Wasp of Quantumania, they would not be in the mess that they're in in the Kang Dynasty film, Avengers Kang Dynasty. That's that's no small thing. That's it's It's important. This is the first bookend of a major, major story to come. In that sense, it's worthwhile checking out. Let's pick tomorrow's episode. 96. 96. I just need you to say it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. This should be fun. This is a documentary, probably a series, maybe a movie. I don't, I'm not really sure. Uh, but people love these animals. It's an animal one. It's not about uh, disasters or sharks. Uh, those are animals, but this is Clan of the Meerkats. Yeah, that's what we're watching next. Probably a National Geographic thing, if not a Disney nature thing. I don't know. Clan of the Meerkats on the next Disney Plus Everyday Challenge. I'll see you back here tomorrow with that. Bye. Oops, I'm wrong. I looked it up and it does not exist anymore. It, at least not in the U.S. version. There was, I looked it up within the app here and on my computer. Can't find it anywhere on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, there was uh, like a Spanish language one when I just Googled it. And then it, like, I clicked on it and it said, oh, in another language. Or no, it wasn't another. It just said it wasn't there. So we have to pick something else. I'm sorry. This rarely happens. Normally, they haven't taken such major things off. They, I have heard that they are looking to take some stuff off in the months ahead, especially if they merge Hulu with Disney+. Plus. That's all up in the air. That's all rumors and stuff. But yeah, there might be some things missing from Disney+, Plus that may, might make my job a whole lot easier to get to <laughs> seeing everything or make it, make it a lot harder to ever find anything I want. So let's pick another one. 152. 152. Oh, well, okay. It's a, it's a short, so that makes things easy for me tomorrow. Um, but we'll find out. This is called Far Away from Raven's Home. I imagine it's uh, Raven Simone. Yeah, maybe. Let's find out. Far Away from Raven's Home is what we're watching next for real this time, assuming that it's... No, I can't find it at all, but that's what we're watching next. Far away from Raven's Home in the next Disney Plus Everyday Challenge. I'll see you back here tomorrow with that. Bye.